Today we start in France, before going to Egypt and eventually moving on to England. So sit back as we go to the early 20th century. Marguerite Alibert was born into a humble Parisian family on the 9th of December 1890. Her father earned his livelihood as a coachman, while her mother diligently served as a housekeeper. The family struggled with financial hurdles, and Marguerite's upbringing unfolded as that of a working-class girl in a city distinctly divided by social classes. Paris was a place of contrasts and cultural vibrancy, known as the City of Lights. It was a hub of artistic, intellectual and technological innovation. The Eiffel Tower had been completed in 1889 and now dominated the skyline. Opulent boulevards and grand residences showcased the affluent upper class. However, in the less privileged neighbourhoods, a contrasting reality prevailed. Impoverished communities endured cramped living conditions and meagre incomes. The economic divide permeated daily life creating a tangible contrast between the indulgent ways of the privileged and the challenging existence of the less fortunate. Marguerite keenly observed her family's unassuming lifestyle against the backdrop of the affluence experienced by the Parisians that her parents served. She gained a valuable insight into the city's economic disparity. At the tender age of 15, tragedy struck the family when Marguerite's four-year-old brother was hit by a truck and died. Overwhelmed by grief and believing that their teenage daughter now needed some spiritual guidance, Marguerite's parents sent her to a stern Catholic boarding school named the Sisters of Mary. During the day, she was not restricted to the confines of the institution. She was instead assigned work as a domestic servant for a wealthy family. She worked hard and developed into a determined and resourceful individual who realised that in the future, she did not want to be subjected to the same harsh and unforgiving life that her mother had experienced. Although the nuns were very careful not to let any of the girls out of their sight at nights, Marguerite somehow managed to evade their vigilance. The consequence of this, however, was that she found herself pregnant less than a year after starting at the boarding school. In the wake of this perceived transgression, she was expelled and sent back to her family home, where despite constant questioning, she refused to reveal the identity of the father. Later, she gave birth to a baby girl, who she named Ramon. Now exiled by the nuns and shunned by her parents, Marguerite faced formidable challenges. She needed to secure employment and look after her daughter. However, unmarried mothers in early 20th century France faced both social stigma and harsh judgment, which often resulted in isolation and exclusion from mainstream society. There were only limited support systems available, which left many to navigate the challenges of raising a child while contending with societal disapproval. Now battling destitution and unable to provide for her daughter, Marguerite made the difficult decision to send the child to live in the countryside. However, despite being apart from her little girl, her resolve remained unwavering. She was determined to escape the clutches of poverty and harboured a steadfast commitment to immerse herself in the sophisticated circles of Parisian high society. In her relentless pursuit of a better life, she toiled tirelessly, yet circumstances remained unfavourable. Ultimately, she found herself drawn into the challenging profession of prostitution, working on the streets outside the fashionable Parisian bars. It soon became apparent that she consistently attracted the wealthiest clientele, and this did not go unnoticed by Madame Dinan, the proprietor of a high-class brothel named Maison de Rendezvous. She recognised Marguerite's beauty, charm and her ability to gain male attention and believed that she deserved to be working in a more exclusive location. She invited Marguerite to join her discreet establishment and become a high-class courtesan, catering to an elite clientele. Marguerite accepted this proposal and soon became the most popular courtesan at Maison de Rendezvous. In fact, she was so popular that many of her clients wanted her exclusively for themselves. One such person was a 40-year-old Parisian named André Mella, who in an effort to maintain discretion, purchased an apartment for their clandestine affair. Marguerite would tell people that they were married, but they were not. In fact, Monsieur Mella was already married to his long-suffering wife, 
Eventually, this relationship ended. But during their time together, Andre had given her money and jewels. She was certainly no longer a woman, destined to endure the struggles of her past. She had proved that she was able to captivate wealthy men and decided that in order to continue her pursuit of well-off clients, she needed to maintain the facade of a rich aristocrat's wife and continued to tell people that her name was Madame Melo. In April 1917, Marguerite met Edward, Prince of Wales, at the Hotel Crillon in Paris. The prince was an officer with the Grenadier Guards on the Western Front during World War I, and while in the French capital, became enamoured with Marguerite, despite her rumoured temper and the whispers of her unconventional habits, like keeping a gun under her pillow. Her intellect, articulate nature and proficiency in the art of companionship had established her reputation as a highly desired courtesan. The two became engaged in a passionate affair, rendezvousing whenever Edward was in Paris. They enjoyed champagne and leisurely drive through the city in a Rolls Royce. However, Edward let his judgment lapse when he wrote indiscreet letters to his mistress, divulging military details and intimate royal family information. He signed these with the letter E and referred to Marguerite in very affectionate terms. For a while, the liaison was rumoured to be intense, but Edward ended the relationship at the end of the war when he returned to England and became involved with a new mistress named Frieda Dudley Ward, who was the wife of a British politician. Although Marguerite's association with British royalty had concluded, she was not short of men who wanted to court her, and soon after, she started to see a wealthy Frenchman named Charles Lorraine. He proposed, and they married. However, their marital bliss did not last long, resulting in a swift divorce and a generous financial settlement in 1921. Marguerite, a woman who had come from a poor area of Paris, had now managed to accumulate substantial wealth and had positioned herself as an independent woman of means. Now, at the age of 30, she was able to indulge in a lavish lifestyle. Her financial prowess, however, extended beyond personal indulgences. She brought her daughter back from the countryside and sent her to boarding school in England. Yet the manner in which she lived became financially demanding and she knew that she needed stability in order to secure her future. She was aware that she may need to again seek the affections of a very wealthy man and would have to use her allure to cement her and her daughter's continued prosperity. In 1922, she accompanied a businessman on a journey to Egypt. Here, she met a young man named Prince Ali Fami. Though not officially bestowed with the title of prince, he was exceptionally wealthy and 10 years younger than Marguerite. After this initial encounter in Egypt, they were formally introduced in Paris in July 1922. The prince became enamoured with the enchanting French socialites and showered her with lavish gifts, including gold and diamonds. A romance then started amidst a glamorous tour of entertainment venues in Deville, Biarritz and Paris. Prince Ali Fami had inherited his father's fortune and when he returned home, he could not get Marguerite out of his mind. He wrote to her, informing her that he was ill and was unable to live without her. Eventually, she agreed to join him. Although the young man's family did not approve of this relationship, the couple were married in a formal ceremony in December 1922, and this was followed by a traditional Islamic wedding the following month. However, the marriage had problems from the start. Marguerite was of course a French woman, and her husband a very wealthy Egyptian. Their age difference, cultural contrasts, and the lavish lifestyle fueled constant conflicts. Staff reported that the French lady covered bruises with makeup, and that her husband often had scratches on his arms and face. Marguerite started to keep a diary in which she wrote whenever she thought her husband had treated her with contempt or physically abused her. However, each time they rowed, they seemed to resolve their differences soon after. On the 1st of July 1923, the couple arrived in London for the holidays to escape the intense heat in Cairo. London was still recovering from the aftermath of World War I and now embraced a more carefree atmosphere. It was a time of simplicity and charm Streets were alive with a gentle buzz as people strolled through parks and enjoyed the sunny weather. Hyde Park became a haven for picnics and the Thames River offered a peaceful escape. London's skyline showcased a blend of architecture 
While iconic structures like Tower Bridge and St Paul's Cathedral stood proudly, new buildings hinted at a post-war shift, foreshadowing the architectural dynamism that would define the city in decades to come. Marguerite was especially looking forward to her summer retreat in London. They chose the illustrious Savoy Hotel as their residence. This renowned establishment held an esteemed status as one of the world's premier accommodations, adding an air of sophistication and luxury to their stay. Of course, they arrived with an entourage that consisted of a secretary, a valet and a maid. But it seemed that Marguerite had other ideas about her summer in London. Soon after arriving, she summoned the hotel doctor and insinuated that her husband was also involved in a same-sex relationship with one of his staff and complained about what she described as his unnatural behaviour towards her in the bedroom. On the 9th of July, the couple immersed themselves in the enchanting world of the opera and saw the Merry Widow at Daly's Theatre. However, the joyous atmosphere of the performance gave way to tension as they returned to the hotel. A late supper was followed by yet another heated argument, a recurring theme of their tumultuous relationship. That night, the sky resonated with the rumble of thunder, while bolts of lightning illuminated the darkness. Then, at approximately 2.30am, on the 10th of July, the serenity of the Savoy was shattered. Marguerite, wielding a semi-automatic Browning pistol, aimed and fired at her husband, who was caught off guard. The shots pierced the stillness of the night, striking the unarmed man in the neck, back and head. The sound of gunfire transformed the elegant surroundings of one of London's most renowned hotels into a scene of tragedy. Swift action followed, as the injured man was urgently placed in an ambulance. However, despite the best efforts of medical professionals, the severity of his wounds proved too great, and he died before he arrived at Charing Cross Hospital. The Savoy Hotel, a symbol of luxury and sophistication, now bore witness to the profound and irreversible consequences of a relationship marked by discord and ultimately a tragic end. Marguerite was arrested and taken to the Bow Street police station. She was interviewed by officers, but the fact remained that she had shot her husband in front of witnesses at the Savoy Hotel. She was then charged with murder. Despite the seriousness of her actions and in the face of impending legal proceedings, she maintained a certain flair and composure, leaving observers to ponder the mysteries beneath the surface of her intriguing demeanour. The trial began on the 11th of September 1923 at the Old Bailey. The court was filled with lawyers, journalists and fortunate members of the public who were able to gain entry. The authorities believed that this would be an unremarkable trial. A woman who killed her husband in front of witnesses was considered to be an open and shut case and was hardly going to draw widespread attention or last very long. However, reality quickly defined expectations. The story of the Egyptian prince, who was murdered by his beautiful French wife, fascinated the British public and within a day of the trial commencing, the courtroom overflowed with spectators. Hopeful onlookers formed queues in anticipation of witnessing the proceedings and exploiting this demand, opportunistic individuals even lucratively sold their coveted spots to those eager to gain entry into the courtroom. Marguerite was defended by Sir Edward Marshall Hall, the leading defence barrister of the time. He was a master in courts and skillfully transformed the narrative from a wife murdering her unarmed husband by shooting him in the back to that of a defenceless French lady who was the victim of brutality and beastliness from her extremely wealthy Egyptian husband. The defence acknowledged the British public's awareness of the strained relations between Egypt and Great Britain. A year prior, Egypt had gained independence, although British troops continued their presence in the country as the government wanted to safeguard British interests, notably the Suez Canal. Sir Edward Marshall Hall strategically utilised this context to evoke public sympathy for his client during the trial. One significant witness was a medical officer at Holloway Prison, where Marguerite had been detained following her arrest. The doctor reported that he had examined her and discovered three abrasions on the back of her neck, which indicated an encounter with a male. According to Mr. Hall, Marguerite's husband had attempted to attack her on the night of the shooting, and believing her life was in danger, she shot him. Madame Fami, speaking only in French, had an interpreter to translate her responses. 
appearing innocent and incapable of harm. She said, I lifted my arm in front of me and without looking, pulled the trigger. The next moment, I saw him on the ground without realising what had happened. I do not know how many times the pistol went off. I did not know what happened and I asked the people, what was all the trouble? Marshall Hall told the court that this was an act of self-defence. In a dramatic reenactment, he took hold of the actual murder weapon, demonstrating the shooting to the jury. He briefly pointed the gun towards them, portraying how frightened his client would have been on the night Ali Fami died. This defence strategy centred on discrediting the deceased man. Leveraging court testimonies, he painted Ali Fami as a dubious figure who lured an unsuspecting French woman to Egypt with promises of wealth, palaces, maids, servants, luxury cars and more. He argued that his actions were fueled by his infatuation with Western women. The barrister went on to catalogue Ali Fami's mistreatment of her, including using a gun to intimidate Marguerite and acting as though she was his possession and demanding unquestionable obedience. The case captivated the press and swiftly turned into a media sensation across Britain, France and Egypt, despite the undeniable fact that Edward Marshall Hall's client had fatally shot her husband. His eloquence in the courtroom sparked a broader debate, causing a shift in public opinion that began to favour his clients. The European press also rallied behind her, depicting the petite French defendant as a woman driven to despair by the harrowing experience endured during her seven months of marriage. In the courtroom, the defence conveyed that Marguerite's husband forbade her from using the car, directing her instead to take tram rides with the male servants. However, they omitted to mention that it was uncommon for a woman from a prominent Egyptian family to venture out alone into the streets of Cairo. Sir Marshall Hall further argued that the unfulfilled promise of a dowry amounted to a financial betrayal and painted a vivid picture of Marguerite's life, saying that although she resided in a palace with maids and servants, she was in fact essentially a woman who lived like a prisoner in luxurious surroundings. The distinguished barrister theatrically presented an unsigned letter to the courts, supposedly from a concerned friend in Paris to Marguerite. The letter advised her against returning to Egypt, citing the sender's knowledge of Egyptian morals and sinister ways. It emphasised the preference to risk money over life, expressing a fear that harm might befall her if she returned. The defence also suggested that the deceased man was involved in a same-sex relationship with one of his staff and that his treatment of his wife in the bedroom was degrading. They emphasised that Marguerite was an innocent European woman who had fallen into the clutches of Ali Fami, who despite his first posing as a gentleman, later revealed his true nature as a womaniser and a philanderer. They added that there was a stark contrast between his initial charm and his subsequent behaviour. The defence insisted that their client had faced horror and disgust at the deception she endured. In court, Marguerite looked a broken woman, assisted to the dock each day. She looked weak and pale and was often seen with tears in her eyes. Her appearance in the courtroom left an indelible mark on both the jury and the public. In contrast, the prosecution led by Percival Clark found itself outmatched and seemed to concede to the extraordinary dramatic display orchestrated by Edward Marshall Hall. However, they did try to divert attention from the theatrical atmosphere in the courtroom. They said that they believed the age disparity between Marguerite and her husband held significance. But when they tried to question Marguerite on her life before she had married for the second time and how she became a single teenage mother, the judge informed the prosecution that this line of questioning was not permitted. They did manage to offer evidence of the deceased man's genuine love for her and presented letters that he had written in which he expressed his profound affection, providing a glimpse into the depth of his emotional connection with his wife. The prosecution did acknowledge the prevalence of marital conflicts. However, they cited the law of the country to highlight certain marital rights while denying the brutality described by the defence. In fact, they suggested that greed played a role in Marguerite agreeing to marry. They told the court that her aspiration to be a princess had led her to forsake her religion and waive her right to divorce for the realisation of this dream. The trial lasted for five days 
and when the prosecution and the defence had delivered their final words in courts, the judge summed up the case. He was very aware of the prevailing public sentiments and the view of the British press, so he issued a strong caution to the jury. The jury's deliberation lasted only an hour. Upon returning to the courtroom, they swiftly delivered their verdict, with the foreman telling the court that they found the defendant not guilty. Upon hearing the verdict, the gallery erupted in applause, prompting the judge to reprimand the spectators and clear the court, leaving only lawyers and journalists present. Addressing Marguerite, he said, Madam Fami, the jury has found you not guilty. You are acquitted of the charges brought against you, and you are free to go. The not guilty verdict sent shockwaves through Britain and Europe. It was suggested that Marshall Hall's defence was tainted by bias, and that he had negatively depicted the Egyptian culture, and suggested that the murder victim targeted Western women, only then to undermine their values of decency. Throughout the trial, there had been no mention of the defendant's previous relationship with the Prince of Wales, who had conveniently been sent to Canada during the proceedings. It has been claimed that Marguerite's arrest and incarceration had greatly concerned the royal household, especially with the unsettling prospect of exposing Edward's champagne rendezvous with a high-class Parisian prostitute while soldiers were enduring the horrors of the trenches. If this information had been made public, it may have cast a shadow over the prince's reputation, threatening to tarnish his standing amid the grim backdrop of wartime sacrifice and suffering. It was rumoured that Ernest Bald was dispatched to Holloway Prison, reportedly to negotiate a deal so she would not expose the compromising letters. The Egyptian government expressed profound shock at both the trial and its verdict. They vehemently protested against Sir Edward Marshall Hall's portrayal of their people and the perception that Madame Fami had seemingly escaped justice within the British legal system. The government contended that the outcome of the trial was influenced by emotional testimonies, alleging that the jury may have been unduly swayed, possibly reaching a verdict tainted by fear and prejudice. The diplomatic outcry underscored not only the perceived injustice in the courtroom, but also the broader implications of international relations and the delicate balance between legal proceedings and cultural sensitivities. Now a free woman, Marguerite returned to Paris. She enjoyed a period in the limelight for the next few years, making appearances in some lesser well-known French films. She resided in an apartment facing the Ritz in Paris, until she died on the 2nd of January 1971, at the age of 80. It was reported that during the subsequent search of her apartment, the few remaining letters from Edwards, probably kept as some form of insurance, were found, but these were never released and have allegedly now been destroyed. Prince Edward ascended to the British throne in January 1936 and became Edward VIII, but his reign was short-lived. Faced with the choice between the monarchy and his love for Wallace Simpson, an American divorcee, he abdicated in December the same year. The couple lived in exile, with Edward assuming the title of Duke of Windsor. He died in 1972 at the age of 77, leaving a legacy defined by personal choices, controversies and a departure from traditional royal conventions. Hello everyone. And thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have. And I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.